Click the bell icon to get latest videos from Ikeda. Hello friends, today we will talk about deadlock handling in the transaction and in a DBMS system. Now when we talk about deadlock handling, we should know how to prevent a deadlock, how to avoid a deadlock and how to recover from a deadlock. We will describe each of this section with the deadlock handling definition of this transaction management system. When we say that there is a deadlock, then we are confirming that there is a set of transaction that waits for another set of transaction to complete. Or we can say that there is a set of transaction on which every transaction is waiting for either of any transactions from that set to commit its operation, then the system is in deadlock. Now let us define it with the definition. So suppose we have a set of transaction from T0 to Tn where T0 is preceding T1, T1 is preceding T2 and in such a way it is having Tn minus 1 is preceding Tn. So now we can say that if T0 is waiting for any transaction T1 to complete its operation, that will happen after it, and T1 waits for T2, Tn minus 1 waits for Tn, then the system is in deadlock. So here we are mentioning that, that the system is in deadlock. Now there is only one way to remove this drastic action. We may either roll back the transaction that is waiting for a transaction that will happen next to it or we can ignore the transaction and perform the rest of the transaction. Now there are three ways for this deadlock handling. The first one is a prevent from a deadlock. That means we will arrive in such a condition that the system will never enter a deadlock and we are ensuring that. So that is the form of deadlock prevention. The next one is deadlock avoidance. That means we will avoid in such conditions that will happen for a deadlock. So the similarity between prevention and avoidance is for prevention we are not considering the conditions that can arise with the deadlock and for avoidance we are conditioning on this particular predicates but not allow them to be happen to arrive in a deadlock. And the final one is the deadlock avoidance or the deadlock recovery. That means the deadlock has been already occurred and we need to recover from that deadlock. So the rolling back of transaction is a way of both the prevention and deadlock recovery, but into different situation. So first we will talk about the deadlock prevention. The first approach for deadlock prevention is no cyclic weight. That means here we are having a cyclic weight in this deadlock state. So if we can confirm that there is no cyclic weight of the transaction for another transaction that is in timestamp greater to it, so we can avoid or prevent the deadlock. The another is more closer to the deadlock recovery, that is other than waiting, we are using rollbacking the transaction to a state that the transaction will now cannot enter this deadlock state. So the first one is, now the first one we can achieve by locking this data item. Now when we provide that lock on a particular data, then we can ensure that the read or write operation can be performed only by acquiring an appropriate lock on that data item. So now we can have the particular lock on that data and then can perform this waiting. So now we will never wait for such a condition that if the lock is not acquired, we will not wait for the data to perform that particular operation. So we will never reach this no cyclic wait condition. And the second one is transaction rollback. See there is when we are waiting for an data item other than having the lock on that item. So now we can roll back the data item if there are two more timestamp that is greater than the timestamp of this transaction TI.
So we will arrive this transaction rollback to avoid this deadlock. So now when we are talking about this no cyclic weights, there are two types of ordering. First one is the ordering of all data items. When we have this ordering of all data items, then we can say that every data item that we are considering must arrive in an order so that we will not enter the deadlock. Now my data items will arrive that first if transaction TI is performing and read item on this queue, then we cannot have that queue to acquire a lock that is acquired by an exclusive mode on another transaction. So in this way, we must define an order so that we are having all data items ordering. Next one is in total order of data items. The total order of data items suggest for that we are having in such a way that if a data item has an exclusive log that is acquired by a transaction TI, that we cannot have that item or the request for a log if it is proceeding on a transaction. So now if TI is given an exclusive log on a data item Q, then if the ordering is already based Q, R, S, T. So now if the TJ is acquiring a shared lock on data item R, so TJ cannot perform to have a request on an exclusive lock on data item Q because Q belongs to proceedings of R and no transactions can have the item that has been proceeding in another transaction and produce an exclusive lock in that transaction. So in that way, the total ordering of data items can be ensured with the conjunction of two-phase locking protocol that we are having an exclusive lock on the data item first. And if there is a net, then we can have the shared lock, but not the vice versa. And now we will talk about the transaction rollback. Now the second approach of this transaction rollback implants or this preemption of data items. That means if a transaction is already performing, then on best some conditions, we can preempt the transaction with another transaction to avoid the deadlock. And in that way, we first need to roll back the first transaction and then we can preempt the second transactions. So let us define this with a denotation. If TI has log granted on a data item Q, now if TSTI is greater than TSTJ, that means the data item that is arriving before TI and the TI is having this log on this data item Q, then TJ will preempt and have a log on data item Q rather than TI what is having. So TJ is being preempt that particular TI to have performed its locking on that particular data item Q. Now the preemption and the rollback will go for these two algorithms. One is the wet tie, another one is wind and recover. The wet tie algorithm supports for no preemption that if there is also the TSTI is greater than TSTJ and TI has acquired a lock, so TJ needs to wait until and unless TI releases the lock and has performed this operation. Now it believes that TI will perform its operation on this data item Q very nearly and TJ can perform after that execution of TI. Now say if TI requests for a data item Q, which is acquired and locked by transaction TJ. Now TI is allowed to wait only if TSTI is less than TSTJ. That means the TI is preceding the transaction TJ in the schedule S. Otherwise we will roll back TI because we will killing it and TI is no wait because the TI will not perform the TJ will happen next and then have the lock. So now when the TJ will, will happen after the TI has acquired the lock, how TI can perform? It will enter the deadlock if there is no wet die algorithm followed by it. Now let us suppose T1, T2, T3, three transaction have its 5, 10 and T15 timestamp respectively. So now we have T1 with 5, T2 with 10 and T3 with 15. Now if T1 is requesting a lock, that is T2 is acquiring, so 5 is less than 10, that is followed by this one, so T1 will wait. That means T1 will go for this wait on T2. 
but if t3 is requesting something that t2 is holding but t3 is happening greater than 10 that is 15 is greater than 10 so it will roll back this ti that means t3 will be roll back so in this way we can suggest that the wait and roll back that is a wait die algorithm followed by within this time step ordering now let us go for this next algorithm now the won't wait is in counterpart of this wait die algorithm so now we are having that particularly when it is younger than ti then the younger one will preempt the data and the next one will be killed off so how we can define this algorithm say suppose that ti has request for a data item q with tj as being acquired the lock then if tsti tstj so now we are actually reversing the counterpart of this wait die algorithm tsti is greater than tstj means tsti is younger so if it has got a greater time stamp that means it is the newer one to enter so now ti can preempt the data and can wait for this queue so now my tj is being wounded by ti so else we will wind up this tj otherwise we will roll back this tj while roll back tj means we are having the tj being preempted by ti other than ti will wait so now it is being wounded by ti or it is roll backed by tj so what we are having other than roll backing the item or the transaction that is the new one to enter we are roll backing the item that has been executing as a preemption to the new item so now if we take example of the previous one that is t1 5 t2 10 t3 15 so now if t1 is holding an item and t2 is waiting for that or requesting for that item so t2 is greater than 5 that means it is newer one so t2 will wait now if t3 is happening on t2 that means t2 has acquired on the lock or t1 has acquired on the lock and t3 being this requesting one so if t3 is a requesting one then we can say that 15 is greater than 10 then also t3 will be wait for q now what happens when t2 is the log that we are having and t1 has requested for a log and t1 is greater than on this queue that means t1 has a larger timestamp than this t2 so what will happen then t1 will be preempted and t2 will be rolled back so in this way the wound wet algorithms is also a counterpart for the wet die algorithm and they both stands for the prevention of this deadlock now the problem with this technique for prevention is this unnecessary rolling back now whenever we are having this rollback sometimes it is not mandatory or necessary to have that so to avoid this expensive rollbacks we can have the similar techniques with this lock timeout mechanism now in this lock timeout say if ti has requested for a particular data item q now we are setting a lock timeout value or the lockout value say the lockout value is 7 now tj is acquiring the lock so ti is having 15 and tj is having 10 so ti is the newer one to enter and tj is 10 so that lockout time of tj is 7 so there is no preemption there is particular locking out of that particular time so now tj will acquire the lock till 10 plus 7 at 17 seconds so now ti waits for 15 and enters the system at 15 so the locking out is 17 so it waits for 7 seconds that means 15 plus 7 22 so it's 22 is greater than 17 so the locking timeout is greater than the lock value so now the lock timeout is greater than the lock value for this particular transaction ti and tj so now ti will be performed onto this lock 
Now again, we if we have that this Tj and waits for a second that will re-enter the value. That means, say suppose the lockout is seven and the log value is for fourteen seconds. So now it will have ten plus fourteen that is twenty four. And the TI will have to wait for 15 plus 7, that is 22. So after 22, it cannot just stay back. It will restart itself and roll back itself only. So there is no force rollbacking. It waits for a time, a counter period of, and after that, it will roll back and restart yourself. Because by the time it believes that next time when TI will arrive, TJ will be finishing task. So now 14, 24 plus 7, that is 31, and it will have this 22 plus 14, 36. So now 36 is greater than 21, so now TI can enter the state because that time TJ is supposed to be finishing its task. So in this way, lock timeout is an another approach other than avoiding this unnecessary rollbacks for this wet die and wound wet algorithm for the deadlock prevention. This transaction on this lock timing out algorithm is particularly easy to implement. But however, we may not say that particular transaction will wait for how much time. That the lock timeout will be based on which things. We do not know that how much time it will be taken for locking a particular transaction. So then it will again can lead to a deadlock by waiting for a long time for that transaction. So that is why in some systems it is avoided for this lock timeout and better stick to this wind wet and wet die algorithm. The next section we will talk about deadlock detection. Now we will talk about this deadlock detection. Now the deadlock detection is a situation that is different from the deadlock prevention in that way that the deadlock is now prevented and now we are in a system we are looking for if there is any deadlock or not. So it is more like the deadlock prevention but it is not before the system has started that we are not arise in a situation that the deadlock will not occur but they are in a situation on a system that deadlock can occur and we need to detect that if there is any deadlock or not. So for the deadlock detection, we need to maintain the information that whichever the data or the transaction that are locked and data item and is requested for a data item on particularly. We will describe a graph containing all the information about this one that the request and the locking and finally release the items in a way so that we cannot have any deadlock any further. So the first one for this deadlock detection is an approach for an wet for graph. So this wait for is a directed graph where we can say it is in set of V and E. So the G is the graph which is a set of V and E where V is the vertices and E is a directed edge towards this Ti and Tj. So when we are having this Ti edge to Tj, that means Ti is preceding the transaction Tj. So now Ti is waiting for an item that is Tj is holding to release the item to finish its transaction. Now we will add in this graph each transaction that is waiting for an data item that is hold by another transaction in this one. And if there is any request that has been fulfilled, then we will remove this edge from this graph. And if the graph is containing no cycles, then we can say that the deadlock is not present in the system. And if it is present in a cycle for that graph on a wait for, then we are saying that the deadlock can occur or occur in some cases on that system. So now let us first define this wait for graph with an example. Say suppose that first the system introduces the transaction T1. So it will be introduced in the vertices set on this transaction on the graph. So now T1 is performing its transaction with some of the items that is locked by T1. Say suppose T2 is now there arrive in the system and it requests for some data items to be locked which is now held by this T1. So now T1 to T2 we can say that if T2 is waiting for that data item. So we can add this age T1 to T2. 
Now we are saying that there arrives another transaction T3 in such a way that T3 also waits for T1 to finish its execution or T1 to release the item. So now we will add a directed edge towards T1 to T3. Now we say that T2 is also waiting for some items that has been released by T1, held by T3, and now it is waiting for this T2 to release the item from T3. So there is a directed edge from T3 to T2. Now finally T4 arrives in this situation that it waits for some data item to be released by T2. So now there will be a directed edge from T2 to T4. So in this, here we are having the data item set Q, R, and S. So first we are having T1 with the data item locked with Q and R. Now T2 request for R. So now T2 is waiting for R that goes with this directed edge. Now T3 arrives and it wants the data item Q and S. So it is allotted the data item S and now waits for the data item Q. So it is wait for the data item Q. Now T2 also waits for the data item S that is held by T3. So now T2 waits for both R and S and has not given any of this data. So it waits for this T3. And finally T4 arrives with the request for Q and S that is now held by this T2. So there is a request edge for this one. So now we can say that we are having T1, T3, T2, T4 and no cycle to it because T1 from the T2 and T3, T3 to T2, but there is no directed edge from T2 to T1, which doesn't make a cycle to it. So we can say that the system on this graph is deadlock free, or we cannot detect any deadlock from this graph. Now if we arrive in other conditions with the other state of data items and also the set of transactions. Now let us look for another example. Now let us constitute with then another T1, T2, T3 and T4 transaction cycles with the data sets Q, R, S and P. So now we are having four data items with four transactions. So first T1 is requesting for Q, R and S. So it will be given Q, R, S. So T1 is present in our graph. Now T2 arrives with the request of R and S to it. So T2 arrived with a request R and S and it is waiting for T1 to release it. So now there will be an edge from T1 to T2. After that T3 arrives with an operations that is request for R and P. So T3 arrives with R and P. From that it will be allocated P. Now it is waiting for R. So the R is held by T1. So now there will be a request stage from T1 to T3. Now say there is a release that we can arrive to T2 which we can have from this R and S and from this Q. So now T2 goes for the weight of R, S, P. So we are having P as a request from this T3 which it is holding. So it will concur and request H from T3 to T2. Finally, we can say that T4 is arriving with this result set that it wants Q and P. So now both are the items that is held by T2 and it is waiting for it. So there will be a request H from T2 to T4. Say suppose the transaction 3 which is also waiting for R and P and here also it is waiting for Q and P. So there will be a request stage for T4 to T3. Now we can see that T1 goes to T2 goes to T3 
goes to T4, again it goes to T3. So there is a cycle for T3, T2, and T4, which we are having in this graph. Now we can say that the deadlock has occurred. So as the deadlock has occurred, so how much the deadlock will affect the transactions? And should we remove all the transactions for our ref graph, or just we remove the transaction that has been affected? So we cannot say that how much frequently the deadlock will occur. If the transactions are involving in this deadlock are number of more, then we need to perform this wait for graph more frequently to detect the deadlock. And if we are having less number of transactions that we can perform at a time interval to detect this deadlock. Now suppose that we are having this transaction that is involved the deadlock, T2, T3, and T4. So we need to have this T2, T3, and T4 restored or rolled back their execution so that we can have the wait for graph without any cycle. But T1 remains there in this graph because it doesn't constitute to the deadlock problem. Now let us move to the deadlock recovery. So first one is the selection of victim. From the deadlock detection algorithm, as we can see that there is T2, T3, and T4 that are the transactions that were involved into the deadlock. While T2 is requesting for Q, R, S, P, T3 were requesting for R, and T4 are requesting for Q, S, and P. So now we can say that T2, T3, and T4, that is which is the selection on these victims. So we can say that T2 is the most dangerous victim in this deadlock because it requires four of these variables which is helped by some other transactions. So now we need to recover this T2 first, after that this T4, after this T3. So the first question is how much dangerous on these transactions are? The second one is by what frequency they are occurring these transactions on deadlock. If it is on a less number, then we need to produce the numbers on the transactions on a rollback. Second, the recovery techniques require two of this process. The first one is the rollback, the second one is the starvation. When we are talking about rollback, then we have two types of rollback. One is the partial rollback, another is the total rollback. The total rollback or an abortion is the system is terminated for that particular transaction and has routed within refreshed and all the transaction has been performed or not. Now the partial rollback is if there is a need for a particular transaction after a period of time. That means the wait for time graph is frequently checking the deadlock for the detection. If it is detected for the deadlock, then it will go for a partial rollback to the situation or till the statement on the transaction which does not involve the deadlock situation. Now if it is from the beginning then we will go for a total rollback, other than that we will go for a partial rollback. So now we can have our partial and total rollbacks based on the recovery technique. And the last one as we have from the recovery technique is the starvation. That means go for the transaction has to starve it before that other transactions can complete in this way so that it will starve for a, such a long time the deadlock will not occur. After starving for such a long time, T2 will have all of its variables or data item released by other transactions and the deadlock will be freed. So in this way, first we tend to select the victim, either roll back it or starve it on the basis of the conditions. So that is all for the deadlock prevention, detection, and recovery as a part of this deadlock handling. Thank you for watching this video. Stay tuned with Ikira and subscribe to Ikira.